Divorce. Mary's parents just got a divorce. Mary is very upset. She thinks that her parents don't love her anymore. She thinks that they got a divorce because of her. She is wrong. Her parents love her just as much as they always did. They aren't getting divorced because of Mary. Sometimes marriages just don't work out. It isn't really anyone's fault. Marriage isn't easy. It is hard for two people to stay together for a lifetime. Sometimes people change as they get older and they move on. Some people have perfectly good marriages and they stay together for their entire lives. Divorce doesn't happen because the parents don't love the children anymore. A lot of children feel that it is their fault, but it isn't their fault at all. Children neither cause the divorce nor can they prevent it. It is up to the parents. Divorce isn't the end of the world. Children can still see both parents and stay with them. Life goes on. Sometimes children can get new stepmothers or stepfathers. That can be a good thing. You just have to be understanding and know that your parents still love you. Life doesn't always go the way that we planned it, but it has its twists and turns. Life is an adventure. If your parents get a divorce, just be understanding. Know that they love you and that this is a hard time for them. It is a hard time for you too, but these things have a way of working themselves out in the end. If my fish could talk, I have a goldfish. He swims around in his bowl all day. He looks bored. I look inside the bowl and watch him. His mouth always moves. He looks like he is talking. I imagine what my goldfish would say if he really could talk. I think he would say, "Hey, I'm bored in this little bowl. Why don't you get me a bigger tank with more fish in it? I would like to have some friends to swim around with." I went out and bought a bigger tank for my goldfish. I put some plants at the bottom of the tank, and I got a miniature deep sea diver to put at the bottom of the tank. I looked into the tank and imagined what my goldfish was saying. He seemed to be saying, "This is a nice tank. It's roomy in here, and you decorated it well. But I still don't have any friends to swim with." I went to the pet store and bought three more goldfish. I put them into the tank. All of the goldfish seemed to look at each other. They swam near each other and seemed to be playing games. I knew which one was my goldfish because he has a black spot on his fin. I looked at him and imagined that he was talking again. He said, "This is great. I have a big new home and friends to swim with. These are nice goldfish that you brought home for me. Thank you." Goldfish can't really talk. I know that. I just like to pretend that my goldfish talks. He seems very happy now with his nice new home and his new friends. I don't think goldfish can smile either, but it looks like my goldfish has a smile on his face. The best teacher. I have had a lot of teachers. Some of them were good, and some of them were boring. There is one teacher whom I remember very well. He is the best teacher that I ever had. His name was Mr. Alden. He was a history teacher. History is not my favorite subject. I don't really enjoy history a lot. When I was in Mr. Alden's class, he made history seem exciting. He was more of an actor than a teacher. If he was describing a war, he would make us feel all the emotions that the soldiers and their families would have felt. We could almost hear the guns firing and the people shouting. He would paint a picture in our minds that was very vivid. When I had a history test in his class, I didn't have to study much. I would remember every word that he had said. I would see him doing the actions that went along with his stories. He was very animated. He would shout out orders as if he was a general, or he would speak softly and reverently when describing the death of a great hero. The most important thing that I learned from Mr. Alban was that I did really like history. I just thought that I didn't like it because most people had made it dull by just reading from the textbooks. History is not just a series of dates and dull facts. History is what really happened. History is real life. All the historical figures had real families and emotions. They weren't just fictional people. After I took history from Mr. Alban, I realized that I really did have an interest in it. He was my favorite teacher, 
and I will always be grateful to him for making me aware of just how interesting history really is. Weather. Sometimes I watch the weathermen on television. It is fascinating to watch him point to different areas of the country on the map. He tells us where the weather will be nice and where it will be bad. The weatherman is not always right. Weather reporting is not an exact science. Nothing is very exact when it comes to the weather. The weather department does a lot of research, but they can never be sure of exactly what will happen. Sometimes it looks like it will be clear, but the wind changes direction and clouds move in. The weatherman can warn people if there is a chance of a hurricane or tornado. The weatherman can also warn people of floods. Sometimes entire towns have to be evacuated because of bad weather. It is important to be aware of the weather. For example, it is not good to be caught in the middle of a field when there is going to be a thunderstorm. You might want to take extra precautions if there is going to be a heavy snowstorm. You would need to be in a secure place if a hurricane or tornado was predicted. You might want to cancel a picnic if you knew that it would rain that day. The weather affects us in so many ways. Some people are really affected by dull, cloudy days. If there are no sunny days, they become very depressed. Heavy air pressure can cause some people to have headaches. Weather affects all of us in one way or another. It is always a topic of conversation. People often say things like "Hello, it's a beautiful day today." Often we plan our lives and activities around the weather. So if you are planning on walking home tonight, keep an eye on the sky. Are those rain clouds up there? You might need an umbrella. How to avoid catching a cold? How many colds do you catch in a year? Most of my friends catch quite a few colds. They cough, sniffle, and sneeze. They carry around tissues and blow their noses all the time. Their eyes water, and they have scratchy throats. I don't get many colds. In fact, I can go for a whole year and never catch a cold. This is why I consider myself an expert on how not to catch a cold. I'll tell you how to avoid catching a cold. I think that you need to take a lot of vitamin C. I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I drink fruit juice too. I also take vitamin C pills. Whenever I begin to feel a cold coming on, I make sure that I have taken my vitamin C pill and I drink a lot of orange juice. That usually knocks the cold right out of my system. I make sure that I get a lot of fresh air. In the winter, a lot of buildings are shut up tight so that the air is stale and people's germs circulate through the buildings. I get outside and breathe in fresh, clean air. If somebody is rude enough to cough or sneeze right in front of me without covering his or her mouth, I just hold my breath for a second. I'm not sure if this works or not, but I don't want to breathe in anybody's cold germs. Many germs are passed through hands. It is important to wash your hands thoroughly if you touch anything in a public place. If I hold a banister while I'm walking down the stairs, I think of all the people who have used that banister, and I make sure that I wash my hands before I eat. Doorknobs also have a lot of germs on them. Money is another thing that is passed from hand to hand and is covered with germs. Sometimes I see people stick money into their mouths. Just think of all the germs that you would be putting into your mouth if you did that. If you just give it a little bit of thought, you can avoid a lot of germs that cause colds. If you eat good food and stay fit, your body will be able to fight off the germs that causes colds and other diseases. It is not always possible to avoid colds, but if you do catch a cold, drink plenty of fluids and get a lot of rest. The future. I sometimes wonder what life will be like in the future. Life has changed so much in just the past few years. I'm sure that there are still big changes that are coming. Do you think we'll still drive cars? Maybe we'll get into computerized vehicles that we won't have to drive. We'll just push a few buttons, and the vehicles will take us to wherever we have to go. Maybe there won't be roads. We might just fly through space to get where we want to go. Instead of telephones, we'll just use our computers. We'll be able to see each other when we talk. That type of thing is already happening. Maybe we won't have to cook our meals. We might be able to push buttons to order whatever we want. A nice roast beef dinner or an ice cream sundae might just pop out of a machine. It would be nice to have a robot to clean the house for you. In the past few years, computers have been extremely important. People used to write to each other through the mail. Now people communicate so much more frequently through email. Most of my friends own computers. If we had all of these things to do the work for us, what would we do? 
We would still need people to program the computers. We could spend more time being creative rather than doing everyday chores. The future holds many surprises. I'm sure that technology will become even more and more amazing. When my parents were young, they had never even seen a color television. Nobody owned a computer. It doesn't take long for things to change a lot. Who knows what amazing things are in store for us? The National Hockey League. The National Hockey League, or NHL, is the largest and most successful North American professional hockey league. The NHL provides Canadians and Americans with the highest caliber and most entertaining hockey on the continent. The NHL was created in 1917 by a group of Canadian and American businessmen. Their two central goals were to create a league that provided the most entertaining hockey in North America and generated revenues and profits. This was a somewhat new idea at the time. While there were some for-profit leagues in existence, most were amateur. This meant that players, coaches, and owners of teams were not allowed to make money from playing the game of hockey. It took several decades for the NHL to become the most dominant league. In the early days, a few professional or commercial leagues competed with the NHL for the public's entertainment dollar. Leagues competed vigorously for the best players in order to be successful and attract spectators and fans. While this was beneficial to players because they could command higher salaries, it was bad for business because owners' expenses skyrocketed. As a result, many teams and leagues went bankrupt. By the 1930s, however, the NHL remained as the only major professional league in North America. This effectively kept players' salaries down and reduced expenses. The NHL's team owners realized that in order for the league to be a successful commercial business, they would have to stop competing against each other off the ice. This was best accomplished by ensuring that only one major league existed, so that competition was reduced. To this day, the same business model is followed, and the NHL is still the only major professional hockey league in North America. For several decades in the mid 20th century, the NHL owners were extremely successful financially. They generated very high profits because, having a monopoly in the hockey market, they could limit the sale and trade of players. When players signed onto a team, they generally did so for life and at the pay rate determined by the owner. Players were forced to accept these conditions because there were no other leagues in existence. This all changed in the 1970s when players organized to form a players' union. Through the collective bargaining process, players gradually fought owners for higher pay and greater rights. Today, many players are very wealthy for this reason. If it was not for the players' union, it is likely they would still be working in similar conditions to those during the early days of the NHL: low pay and little freedom to move from team to team. With NHL owners and players cooperating, the NHL continues to be the most successful and entertaining hockey league in North America. Teams across Canada and the United States compete for the prized Stanley Cup, the most sought-after trophy in North American hockey. Drug use in sport. Athletes using drugs to enhance performance has become one of the greatest problems facing elite international sport. Major sports organizations, such as the International Olympic Committee, are putting a lot of time, effort, and money into the detection of drugs. The race between athletes using drugs and detection agencies seems to be just as fierce as sport competition itself. Athletes have been using drugs or other stimulants to enhance performance for centuries. Even athletes in the ancient Olympic Games in Greece used various stimulants to enhance performance. However, since the 1950s, the degree of drug use has risen to a level never before seen in human athletic history. Drug testing began in the Olympic Games in the 1960s. One of the first sports to encounter drug use was cycling. During the 1960 Summer Olympic Games in Rome, Italy, a cyclist died from an amphetamine use. In 1967, another cyclist died in the Tour de France cycling race. Around the same period, bodybuilders in the United States were experimenting with newly developed synthetic steroids that built muscle mass. As a result, the International Olympic Committee started testing for steroids during the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada. Probably the most famous case of an athlete using drugs was Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson. After winning the 100-meter sprint in the 1988 Summer Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, Johnson's drug test was found to be positive. 
Johnson took a synthetic steroid to build muscle mass and enhance power. Eventually, Johnson was stripped of his gold medal. In the aftermath of Johnson's positive drug test, the Canadian government conducted a federal inquiry into the drug use in Canadian sport. The government inquiry was the largest one to have been conducted in any country up to that point in time. The results of the inquiry found that drug use among Canadian athletes was very common. The inquiry stated that there were problems beyond just individual athletes, such as Johnson taking drugs to enhance performance. Indeed, it was stated that there was a moral crisis throughout sport. Today, the race between drug detection agencies and athletes who use drugs continues. In January 2000, the International Olympic Committee created a new agency to detect drug use: the World Anti-Doping Agency (WADA). WADA has provided increased resources for drug detection, especially in Olympic sports. Hopefully, WADA will be able to keep pace with the current moral crisis in sport. Participation. Participation was the name of the Canadian government program designed to encourage Canadians to get and stay physically fit. Created in 1971 by the federal government, participation was successful in encouraging Canadians to be active and to stay healthy. Participation was created by the Canadian Liberal government of Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Trudeau believed that sport and recreation should play an important role in the lives of Canadian citizens. His government took two steps towards the accomplishment of this goal. First, a government agency was created to provide funds for high-performance athletes, such as those training and competing in the Olympic Games. A second agency was created to encourage participation and physical activity in the general Canadian population. It was out of this second agency that participation was born. Participation became famous in the 1970s because of a series of television commercials. In these commercials, a young Canadian in his 20s was seen being outrun by a 60-year-old Swedish man. The message was that Canadians had become lazy and inactive. This was probably true of Canadians at the time. Physical fitness was not highly encouraged in schools, especially for women. Also, the government played little role in encouraging physical activity before participation. The result of participation was impressive. Canadians became more active in the years following the program's inception. Also, fitness and activity were encouraged through physical education programs. Participation was seen as a positive program because it got Canadians active while reducing healthcare costs caused by inactivity and poor physical conditioning. Recently, participation was terminated by the federal government because of a lack of funding. Many people thought this was a shame, given the positive messages the program gave to otherwise inactive Canadians. Despite the program's termination, participation has made a long-lasting impression on Canadians. Hopefully, its positive example of physical fitness for Canadians will continue in the future. The Olympic Games. The modern Olympic Games began in the late 19th century as a revival of the ancient Greek Olympics. Now, just over 100 years old, the modern Olympic movement is the biggest and most important sports movement in the world. In fact, many people believe the Olympic Games to be the most important cultural event of any kind in the world. The modern Olympic Games were the brainchild of Frenchman Baron Pierre de Coubertin. De Coubertin's dream for an international sports event and cultural movement became a reality in 1894 at the International Athletic Congress in Paris. After the games were constituted in 1894, the first Olympic Games was held in Athens, Greece, in 1896, in recognition of the ancient Greek Olympic Games. The original purpose of the Olympic Games, in De Coubertin's mind, was to celebrate and strengthen the physical, mental, and cultural qualities of humanity. The games would blend sport with culture, tradition, and education. The philosophy of Olympism is based on the joy of physical and mental effort and the respect for universal ethical principles. De Coubertin envisioned creating a more noble and sympathetic humanity through the Olympic movement. The sports events themselves, De Coubertin modeled after the English public school sports system. He saw in upper-class English boys' sport the qualities of camaraderie, nobility, and honesty. Most importantly, however, was adherence to the rules of sport. In particular, the rule that stated sport ought to be amateur in nature. De Coubertin believed participants should never participate in sport for the purpose of making money. To do so would contradict the underlying philosophy of sport. 
Breaking the amateur rule in de Coubertin's time was as serious a violation as taking drugs to enhance performances in today's world of sport. Over time, the Olympics grew to be the largest international festival of any kind. Today, debates exist as to the degree to which the modern games adhere to de Coubertin's original intent. On the one hand, Olympic sport is truly international in nature, as de Coubertin would have wanted it. On the other hand, it is doubtful that de Coubertin would have admired the existence of politics, commercialism, and drug use in sport. The Olympics have become truly international, but perhaps at a price. There is little question that the Olympic Games hold out the possibility for fulfilling de Coubertin's original goal of sport contributing to a better, more peaceful, and understanding world. Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was one of the greatest scientists of all time. Pasteur made very important discoveries in biology and chemistry, and the techniques he developed helped greatly develop medical science and the agricultural and food industries. Pasteur was born in a small town in France during the year 1822. When he was a young man, Pasteur studied science at a university in the city of Paris. He soon did some excellent work in chemistry, and later began his famous study of germs. Pasteur was one of the first scientists to understand that many diseases could be caused by extremely small invisible organisms. Only a few other scientists had believed this before Pasteur. He advised doctors to wash their hands thoroughly before treating patients. Pasteur also demonstrated that life forms did not arise spontaneously. His research confirmed the idea, developed by previous scientists, that a living organism would not appear unless other individuals of its kind were present. One of Pasteur's most important contributions was a technique that has been named after him: pasteurization. Pasteurization kills the germs that are found in drinks. Such as milk or beer, because of Pasteur's technique, people are no longer infected with diseases by drinking these liquids. Just as important as pasteurization was a technique called immunization. Pasteur found that a person or animal could be made safe or immune from a disease by injecting the person with some weakened germs that cause the disease. The body can resist the disease after being immunized in this way. Today, many diseases are prevented by the use of this technique. Pasteur's discoveries also helped to save people who had already been infected with diseases. One such disease is rabies. Rabies is a disease that sometimes occurs in animals. This disease usually kills the animal, but before dying, the animal becomes very aggressive. And may spread the disease by biting a person or another animal. One day, the parents of a young boy came to Pasteur. Their son had been bitten by a dog that had the rabies disease. The parents knew that their son would die from the disease unless something could be done to save him. Pasteur agreed to help the boy, and the immunization technique saved the boy's life. Pasteur died in 1895. He was greatly admired around the world for his achievements, which have helped all of mankind. Today, Pasteur is considered to be the greatest figure in the history of medicine. Psychology. Are you interested in the behavior of people and animals? If you are, then you might enjoy the study of psychology. Psychology is the study of behavior. But this is a very large area of study. There are several different branches of psychology, each of which studies a different aspect of behavior. Social psychologists study interactions among people. For example, a social psychologist might try to learn about the situations that cause people to behave aggressively. Another question studied by social psychologists is why certain people. Become attracted to each other. One of the interesting problems in social psychology is conformity. What causes people to behave in the same way, and to follow what others do and say? Cognitive psychologists study thinking, 
memory, and language. When problem studied by cognitive psychologists is how people remember numbers. For example, what is the best way to memorize some numbers? Is it better to repeat the numbers to oneself or try to attach some meaning to these numbers? A cognitive psychologist might also study language. For example, why can young children learn a second language so quickly and easily? Cognitive psychologists are also interested in the ways that people learn to solve problems, such as finding a new place. Clinical psychologists study mental illnesses. For example, clinical psychologists might try to find out the causes of depression and to figure out ways of helping people who are depressed. Other clinical psychologists might study the behavior of people who suffer from addiction to drugs so that this problem can be prevented and treated. Another topic of interest to clinical psychologists is violent behavior. It is very important to find ways of preventing violence and to change the behavior of persons who act violently. Some psychologists are interested in the measurement of psychological characteristics. For example, psychologists might develop tests to access a person's intelligence, personality traits, or interests. These tests can be used to help people make decisions about education, occupation, and clinical treatment. Psychologists who study the behavior of animals are called ethologists. Ethologists often go into the wilderness areas to watch the activity of birds, fish, or other animals. These psychologists try to figure out why it is that some animals have instincts for various behaviors, such as parenting, mating, or fighting. Some anthologists have learned very much about the unusual behaviors observed in many animals. These are only a few of the many areas of psychology. Truly, psychology is one of the most interesting areas of knowledge. Corruption. When an official of a government or business is acting dishonestly, we say that this person is corrupt. Corruption is a serious problem in many countries around the world. There are several different kinds of corrupt practices, including bribes, kickbacks, nepotism, and embezzlement. A bribe is a payment of money or some other benefit in exchange for a decision that would not otherwise be made. For example, an accused criminal might bribe a judge so that the judge would make a decision of not guilty. Another example is that a business owner might bribe a government official so that the official would allow the construction of very unsafe buildings. A kickback is similar to a bribe, except that the official receives some part of the money in a dishonest business deal. For example, governments sometimes decide which company should build a road. A company might offer money to a government official who makes the decision, so that this company will be chosen, even if it's not the best company for the job. Nepotism happens when an official unfairly gives advantages to his or her relatives. For example, a government official might hire a brother or sister to do a job, even though other people would be much better qualified for that job. Of course, all of us want to help our relatives, but it is wrong to do this at the expense of the public. Embezzlement happens when an official secretly steals some money from a company or government. For example, a manager at a company might secretly move some of the company's money to his or her own bank account, and that manager might lie about his or her expenses in order to receive more payment from the company. Corruption has very bad effects on people in several ways. Sometimes it can lead to very dangerous situations. One example of this is when unsafe construction projects are approved by officials who have been bribed. Another example is when criminals are freed as a result of bribes. Also, a country's economy can be damaged by corruption. For example, if companies must pay bribes in order to do business, then they may decide to leave the country. Also, if people's tax money is stolen by corrupt officials, this makes the people poorer. In addition, when company officials are corrupt, it makes the company less able to compete with other companies. How can corruption be stopped? An important step is for each person to decide not to act in ways that are corrupt. People must agree to take this problem seriously. Also, each company and each government must have strict rules about corruption. 
it must be very clear to all employees, from the lowest to the highest, that corruption is totally unacceptable. Canada, provinces and territories. Canada is one of the largest countries in the world. It is located in the northern half of the continent of North America, above the United States. Canada is divided into ten provinces and three territories, each of which is different from the others. The province of British Columbia is located at the far western end of Canada. British Columbia stretches from the Pacific Ocean at the west to the Rocky Mountains at the east. British Columbia contains the city of Vancouver, where two million people live. Most of the land of British Columbia is very mountainous, with vast forests covering the mountains. In British Columbia, forestry is an important industry, providing wood for people around the world. Moving east from British Columbia, the next provinces are Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. These are known as the prairie provinces because they are mostly made of flat, grassy land called prairie. Alberta is the province where the flat prairie meets the tall, beautiful Rocky Mountains. In Alberta, there are many fields where oil and gas are found, and there are also many farms where cattle are raised. Saskatchewan is the province that grows the most wheat. Wheat from Saskatchewan is sent around the world to make bread and pasta for many people. Manitoba is the other prairie province. Its largest city, Winnipeg, is about halfway between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Winnipeg has the coldest winters of any large city in the world, with temperatures sometimes reaching negative 40 degrees Celsius. Moving east, the next province is Ontario. The land in the northern part of Ontario is very rocky and contains many thousands and thousands of lakes. Many mines are found in northern Ontario. In the southern part of Ontario, there is good farmland, and there are also many cities where factories produce cars and steel. Ontario contains Canada's largest city, Toronto, as well as the capital city of Canada, Ottawa. In the southern part of Ontario are four of the largest lakes in the world, known as the Great Lakes. Next to Ontario is the province of Quebec. Unlike the other provinces where most people speak English, most of the people in Quebec speak French. The capital of Quebec is called Quebec City, and this is one of the oldest cities in North America. Quebec City contains many buildings that are hundreds of years old. Also in the province of Quebec is the city of Montreal. Of all the French-speaking cities in the world, only Paris is larger than Montreal. In the eastern part of Canada are the Atlantic provinces, which are next to the Atlantic Ocean. These provinces are New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland. In the Atlantic provinces, fishing is an important industry. Tourism is also important, as many people come to see the beauty of these provinces. The people in these provinces are said to be the friendliest in Canada. In the far north of Canada are the three territories that lie beside the Arctic Ocean, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavik. Many of the people in these territories are the native people of Canada, known as the Indians and the Inuit. The northern areas have very cold, dark winters. The summer is short, but the days are very long and bright. Learning to Dance I went to England with my mother. She used to be a singer in a band. We went to the hotel that she used to sing at. It was a big, fancy hotel. Some of the people that she knew when she sang in the band were still there. They remembered my mother, and they had a good time talking to her and remembering old times. Many people told me that I looked like my mother.
In the hotel, they had a fancy hall where they had ballroom dancing. I am not used to that kind of dancing. I always dance to rock music. A man told me that he would teach me how to dance. It looked very easy. I held one of his hands and put my other hand on his shoulder. He told me exactly how to move my feet. I was very clumsy and I stepped on his toes. He was patient with me and he counted one, two, three. I tried to waltz with him. I would start out pretty well, but then I would get mixed up and stand on his toes again. The man laughed about it. I told him that I wasn't a very good dancer, but he said that I was good for a beginner. I think he was just being polite. The man asked my mother to dance. My mother is a very good dancer. I didn't know that about her. She never stepped on the man's toes once. The man thanked us for dancing with him, and I thanked him for giving me dancing lessons. I don't think I'll ever be very good at that type of dancing. Each generation has a specific type of dancing. The way that I dance is different from the way that my mother dances. The way that I dance doesn't involve moving your feet too much. I'm not too good at fancy steps. Superheroes. When my brother was very young, he loved superheroes. He collected plastic figures of all the superheroes. I think he had every superhero figurine that there was. He used to tie a towel over his shoulders and run through the backyard. He pretended that he was rescuing people. One time he stood on the roof. He really thought that he could fly with his superhero cape on. He would have hurt himself if he had jumped. My dad saw him and told him to get down. My dad explained to my brother that superheroes are not real. Real people cannot fly from rooftops. My brother was disappointed. He thought that the superheroes really existed. My dad explained that most superheroes were created as comic book characters. Somebody used their imagination to make them up, and then an artist drew them. My brother was not impressed. He said that he wanted to meet the superheroes. My father told him that he might meet someone dressed up as a superhero, but it wouldn't really be a superhero in the costume. It is hard to explain to small children that the things that they see in comic books and on television aren't really real. My brother still pretends that he is a superhero. He doesn't jump from rooftops, but he runs around and makes noises like he is flying. I look at him and remember when I used to do things like that. I'm more mature than my brother. I know that superheroes aren't real. But I know that he is having fun and using his imagination. Being a princess. Sometimes I think that I would like to be a princess. A princess would live in a palace, and wear beautiful clothes. She would have servants to do chores for her, and she would probably marry a handsome prince. People would recognize her. They would wave to her as she drove by. It seems like it would be a lot of fun to be a princess, but maybe it wouldn't be so nice. Maybe it would be terrible to be recognized by everyone. Maybe a princess would feel like everyone was watching her. She would have to look nice every time she left the palace. There would always be people with cameras who wanted to take her picture. A princess would have no privacy. Even in her own palace, there would be servants around. So she would never really be alone. If I were a princess, I would worry about security for my family. Sometimes, people who are in high positions are threatened by other people. That would be a worry.
I'm not so sure that being a princess would be all that much fun. I think it might be better to be just a normal person like me. I don't have to worry about looking wonderful all the time. People don't follow me around and take my picture. Whenever you see a picture of a princess, she is smiling. I wonder if she's smiling on the inside or just smiling for the camera. My worst fear I am afraid of water. I don't know why I am afraid. I have never had a bad experience in the water. I just never learned to swim. I should have done that when I was just little. It would be easier for me to swim now if I had started when I was young. I will go into the shallow water, but I start to panic when the water gets higher than my chest. I don't like the feeling of not being able to put my feet on the bottom of the pool or the lake. I don't like to get water up my nose. I choke and cough when that happens. My friends just tell me to relax and I will float. But I find it hard to relax in deep water. They keep telling me that if I panic, I will sink. Most of my friends have had swimming lessons. Some of them are even lifeguards. They have tried to teach me to swim, but I think I need to go to a place where they actually teach swimming. It would be nice to jump into a pool of cold water on a hot summer day. That would be so refreshing. If I go out onto a boat, I always wear a life jacket. I think it is wise to do that. Everyone should wear a life jacket on a boat. I would rather be safe than sorry. I have decided that I will overcome my fear. I will go and take swimming lessons. I have a goal. By this time next year, I would like to be able to swim the length of the pool without being afraid. It is best to face your fears and deal with them. I hope that I can overcome my fear of water. If I live to be 100, I think I would like to live to be 100. It seems like an awfully long time to live. It is an entire century. Imagine all the changes that you would see if you lived to be 100. I had a neighbor who was 85. She used to tell me what things were like when she was a little girl. She told me what my town used to look like, what her clothes were like, and what her school was like. I used to enjoy listening to her stories. Everything was so different when she was young. Listening to her was like having history come to life. I used to try to imagine what life was like for her back then. If I was a hundred, and I had grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I would tell them stories about my childhood. I would hope that I had a good memory so that I could remember everything. If I do want to live to 100, I'll have to have a healthy lifestyle. Not too many people live to be that old. If I do get to be that old, I hope I'll still be mentally alert and physically agile. In my country, the Prime Minister sends a letter of congratulations to anyone who has their 100th birthday. People who live to be 100 are very special. Maybe in the future, with better medical care and healthier lifestyles, more people will live to be 100. If I live to be 100, I'll have a birthday cake. But I won't put 100 candles on the cake. I could never blow out 100 candles. What I like most and least about myself. I was trying to think up the best and the worst things about myself. I think the best thing about me is that I am very friendly. I have a lot of friends and they all like me. I try to be good to my friends. I don't often have arguments with people. I think that I am quite easy to get along with. The worst thing about me is that I sometimes feel sad. Sometimes I don't feel sad for any particular reason. I just get into moods where I am depressed. Sometimes there is a reason to be sad. I was sad when my pet frog died. I was sad when I lost my favorite baseball card. On those days, I'm still nice to my friends, but inside I feel like there is a heavy weight in my chest. I think that everyone feels sadness sometimes. I try to do things that make me happy whenever I get into one of my sad moods. Last Saturday, I felt a bit sad, so I called up my friend John and asked him if he wanted to go to the movies. We went to a comedy. We laughed all the way through the movie, so that by the time the movie was over, I didn't feel sad anymore. 
My friendliness is my best trait, and my sad moods are my worst traits. I have to work at getting over my sad moods more quickly. Being sad doesn't do anyone any good. There is no use in feeling sorry for oneself. Stars in the midnight sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. This is a little poem song I always say when I'm outside and I see the stars. When I see the first star of the night, I always say this one: Star light, star bright, first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might have the wish I wish tonight. Do you have a special thing to say about the stars? Stars are beautiful, bright spots in the sky. Stars are usually seen at night when it is dark. We can't see them in the daytime because the sun is so bright, the brightest star of all. I like staying up late just to look at the stars. One time I was outside at midnight, and the stars seemed to sparkle and dance. They really did look like diamonds dancing in the sky. If you watch the stars long enough, you may see a falling star or a shooting star. I have seen both. A falling star is where the star just seems to drop, and it leaves a trail of what appears like stardust. A shooting star is very beautiful. It shoots across the sky, leaving a long trail of colorful stardust. Shooting stars seem to brighten up the whole sky. They usually seem quite close to Earth. Have you ever watched the stars and got the urge to reach out and touch them, or even join them in their secret dance? I wonder what it'd be like to see a star up close. Would it look like the moon? Maybe one day when I am older, I will go up in a rocket ship and visit the dancing stars in the midnight sky. Music. A song comes on the radio. My lips start to move, singing along. My fingers start to snap. My feet begin to tap. The music sinks deep into my soul. I listen to the music as it fills my brain, and I remember when I used to sing. I sang in front of huge crowds. I loved it when they watched me and clapped for me when I was finished. Letting out my feelings when I was sad, mad, happy, or glad was when I would sing. I sang in the shower. I sang in the rain. I sang in church. I sang walking down the street. Music has always been a big part of my life. It seems like I was a baby when I started playing the piano. I would sit on my sister's lap while she played the piano, and I would bang on the keys. I remember sitting beside her and learning how to sing. I sang my little lungs out. As I grew, I listened to other singers on tapes, the radio, and CDs. I took those things that I had heard from different singers and made myself sound like them. Soon, I could take what I had heard all my life and make it into my own sound. I have always liked singing jazz and blues. I don't listen to jazz and blues a lot, however. I listen to pop, rock, classical, and some country. As you can see, I like many types of music. I have seen musicals too, like Phantom of the Opera and Les Misérables. Those musicals were amazing. They were such bright costumes and stage sets, not to mention the wonderful songs and singing. Music has been on this earth since the beginning of time, and it touches everyone in a different way. I know it has not only touched mine, but is a big part of my very being. First date, ring ring. The phone is ringing. My mother answers it. Hello, she says. It is for me. When I pick up the phone, I hear a boy's voice. It is a boy I go to school with. This boy is very nice, and he is cute too. He asks me if I want to go out for dinner with him tonight. I say yes. He's going to pick me up at 5:30 p.m. in the evening. He has a nice red car. Before he picks me up, I have to find an outfit to wear. I am nervous and don't know what to wear, so my sister picks out an outfit for me. I feel excited and have the sensation of butterflies in my stomach. The inside of my hands are damp too. I put on my outfit. And do my hair. My sister gives me some nice clips to put in my hair. Ding dong, the doorbell buzzes. My date is here. I hurry to the door so I can greet him. He tells me that I look nice and that we are going to a place called M T Bellies. When we arrive at M T Bellies, there is loud music playing. A smiling waitress comes who serves us our food. 
I order a large Caesar salad. My date orders steak. When it arrives, the food looks and is delicious. The waitress asks us if we want dessert after we've finished. But we are too full. So we ask for our bill to pay. My date pays for the meal. I brought money just in case we would share the cost. When we leave the restaurant, we go for a walk by the river. It is a beautiful night. I am enjoying my first date. I am laughing and having fun. It is time for us to go home. So my date takes me home. I smile and thank him for the great time. I hope he'll ask me out again. University. It's time to sign up for school. This year, Natalie is going to Brock University. She has never been to university before. She is a little bit scared. She hopes she meets nice new friends. Natalie stood in line to get her picture taken. The picture was put on a card. The card was her picture ID, identification. She would use this card if she needed to buy books from the school bookstore, if she wanted to get a book from the library, or if she wanted to use the pool. After all of the signing up and money was paid, Natalie went out to lunch with her mother. Mom, I'm kind of scared about going to school. I'm going to be the youngest kid there. I don't know how to take notes. The teachers might be mean. Natalie rambled on. Her mom just calmed her down and said, "Take one day at a time, Natalie. Worry only about today." Hmm. You're right, mom. Thanks. Natalie was very scared on the first day of school. She made sure she had all of the books she needed and lots of pens, pencils, and erasers. She walked into the front of the building and went on her way to try and find her classroom. Natalie got through her classes and met a lot of new people, nice people. Her classes seemed to go by really fast, and the day went by even faster. When Natalie got home, she was so excited. She told her mom that classes weren't all that scary. The students and the teachers weren't scary either. Natalie knew that the schoolwork would be hard, but she felt good about the people she had met that day. She knew she'd have a good year. School dance. It is the first school dance that I have ever been to. All of the boys are standing on one side of the gymnasium, and all of the girls are on the other side. There is loud music playing, and I can hardly hear my friends talking. The music is going fast, and some people are starting to move to the beat of the song. Soon, all the girls are dancing, but the boys are still standing against the wall. Then the song ends, and slow music comes on. I don't know what to do, so I just go and stand against the wall. Then one of the boys in my class comes over and asks me if I would like to dance to the slow song. I really feel awkward and nervous, but say yes. We go out into the middle of the gym, and he puts his hands on my waist, and I put my hands on his shoulders. We start to move to the music, and we step on each other's feet. He is bigger than me, so my toe starts to hurt a little bit. As we continue to slow dance, more boys and girls come to the middle of the gym to dance together. It sure is funny to watch people dance because they are stepping on each other's toes and bumping into each other and turning in opposite directions. Soon the song ends and the boys go to one side of the gym again. The girls decide that they want to dance to a fast song, so they stay in the middle of the gym and dance with one another. Our teachers are making sure that we are behaving because they are watching us. I wonder if they want to dance. They probably are remembering their first school dance. I wonder if someday I'll be grown up, just like the teachers, and laughing at the memories of my first school dance. I sure hope so. Health. Our health is very important to us. People can have good jobs, money, or good looks. However, if they become sick, those things don't mean a thing. It is wonderful to feel good. Feeling good isn't just about our body; it is also about our mind and spirit. 
We need to feel good in every area of our life. One of the things we can do to be healthy is to get enough sleep. If we don't sleep well or enough, it hurts our body. It is during sleep that our body restores itself. Everybody knows we should also eat good foods. We need milk products, meats, fruits, and vegetables, and breads and cereals. We shouldn't eat too much fat or sugar things either. Of course, we just shouldn't eat too much at all. Another thing that is very important is water. Most people, and we need to keep that replaced with good water often. Exercise is very good for both our body and mind. It is good for our heart, lungs, muscles, and bones. It gets oxygen to our brain to help us think better. It can help us be smarter. Doing things that we believe are right and good gives us peace inside. It makes us nicer people and is good for our spirit. When we do what we know is right, it helps to reduce stress, which isn't good for any part of us. When we take care of our body, mind, and spirit, we feel good all over and inside too. What a beautiful world this would be if we could all work at doing these things for ourselves and also trying to be a help to others. The trunk in the attic. Last month, my grandmother asked me if I could help her to clean out her attic. I was happy that she asked me. My grandmother says that her attic is full of junk. I think that her attic is full of treasures. I helped her to dust and vacuum the attic. I pulled and pushed around boxes and crates. I helped her to wash the floors and walls. My favorite thing that I did was to sort through the old trunk that she had up there. The trunk had a rusty latch on it. It was a bit difficult to open, but my grandmother got a knife and pried the latch open. The trunk was full of all kinds of things. There were lots of clothes. Some of the clothes had been my grandmother's. There was a blue velvet dress that she had worn to a dance when she and my grandfather were dating. It was a beautiful dress, but there were a few moth holes in it. There were some of my mother's old clothes. There was a pair of bell-bottom slacks that had bright flowers on it. I couldn't believe that my mother had ever worn something like that. There were some of my mother's old report cards. Some of her marks weren't very good. I had fun reading the report cards. There were photographs. There was a picture of my grandparents holding my mother when she was a baby. There was an old baseball glove that one of my uncles had owned. There was even one of my old dolls in there. One of her legs was missing. My grandmother said that I was rough on my dolls when I was little. I should have taken better care of my toys. There was even some old jewelry. I tried on some of the old clothes and jewelry. I told my grandmother that I liked looking through old things. My grandmother told me to keep whatever I wanted. She said that it was all junk. I still say that her trunk was full of treasures. Hot and cold. I notice that whenever it is summer, people complain about the heat, but whenever it is winter, people complain about the cold. It seems that people are never satisfied. I don't like the winter. It is usually much too cold for me. My teeth chatter, and my fingers turn numb whenever the weather gets cold. It is hard for me to warm up once I start to freeze. I try to wear layers of clothes, but winter winds go through my clothes no matter how much I wear. My feet feel like they are blocks of ice on a cold January day when I walk home from school. I would not like to live in a place that had cold climate all year long. I am not comfortable when it is too cold. I like the summer. Some people say that it is hot and sticky in the summer, but I don't mind the heat at all. I love to feel the warm sunshine on my skin. I like the freedom of not having to wear heavy coats and boots. I am the happiest when there is a slightly cool breeze that comes along to refresh you on a hot summer day. I could live in a place with a hot climate. I would enjoy that. Of course, when you are in a place with a hot climate, there are more bugs than in places with cooler climates. I don't care for bugs. Where I live, it is very humid. 
the heat and moisture combine to make it uncomfortable sometimes. It is nicer when the heat is high, but the humidity is low. It would be better if I lived somewhere where it was hot, but not humid. That would be just perfect. Walk a mile in my shoes. Have you ever heard the saying, walk a mile in my shoes? I think it's a very good saying. Do you know what it means? It means that before you judge someone, you should put yourself in his or her position. For example, if someone was running in a race and they did very poorly and came in last, it wouldn't be fair to say, oh, he's just a terrible runner. You would have to look at all the circumstances that made the person lose the race. Maybe they pulled a muscle in their leg the day before. Maybe this is their very first race. Maybe they are not in good form because something isn't right in their lives. There can be so many things that affect a person's life, performance, and moods. There can be so many things that affect a person's life, performance, and moods. If someone was very quiet at a party, you couldn't just assume that they weren't friendly. You don't know what is happening in their lives. They could be feeling ill, or they might have just had a bad experience. Nobody can know exactly how another person feels. Even if someone tells you what he or she is experiencing, you still won't fully understand what is going on inside the other person. Everyone perceives and feels things differently. To walk a mile in someone else's shoes is to try and understand things from that person's perspective. We are all shaped by the events that have taken place in our lives. No two people have gone through the exact same things. So, before you are quick to judge someone, stop and think about what it is that they might have gone through. You won't always understand why people do what they do, but you can try to understand and put yourself in their position. If I could go back in my life. If I could go back in my life and do some things differently, this is what I would do. I would not waste so many hours in front of the television set. I would get out and enjoy my life rather than watching actors and shows. I would be a little more considerate of other people. I would realize that my mother has more to do than pick up after me. I would pay more attention in school. Tests are easier when you have paid attention rather than fooling around in class. I would save more money rather than spend it on useless things. I would read more. Reading is enjoyable and it opens the doors into all kinds of wonderful places, both real and imagined. I would learn to play an instrument. Music is always appreciated if it is played well. I would eat better foods. I would try to stay healthy through my diet and exercise. I would take more pictures and I would keep a journal. Memories are very precious. I would take the time to listen to what people have to say. People appreciate a good listener. I would take the time to enjoy each day as it comes. Sometimes I am so busy looking forward to what is coming up that I don't take the time to enjoy the day that I am living in. That's what I would do if I could go back in my life. In fact, I think I'll just make a habit of doing all of those things all through my life. Joking. Joking is good. Jokes can be very funny. Jokes can also be hurtful. Jokes can be tasteless, too. It is not an easy thing to find jokes that do not offend anyone. Some jokes make fun of different races. Those jokes are not funny. They are hurtful. It is not right to tell racist jokes. Many jokes use bad language or are about questionable subject matter. These jokes are also not acceptable. Many people are highly offended by rude jokes. What some people find funny, others will not. Comedy is a very personal thing. Some people like slapstick comedy. That is the kind of comedy that the Three Stooges use. Some people like very subtle humor. Some people will laugh at just about anything. Sometimes it is not appropriate to laugh, but you feel like laughing anyway. Did you ever see anyone fall down? Did you feel like laughing when they fell down? You were probably worried that they had hurt themselves, yet the way that they fell was so funny that you felt like laughing. It's not funny when someone falls, but you can't help but laugh even though you try to hide it. Jokes and comedy differ from culture to culture. 
Many people from other countries come here and don't understand our comedy. Jokes and comedies are often geared toward our environment. Sometimes comedians make fun of the things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, like going to the bank or going grocery shopping. We can all relate to that. Being a comedian is not an easy job. Telling jokes and making people laugh is extremely difficult. Jokes are fun, and they are funny if they are good. Jokes can get you into a lot of trouble if they are inappropriate, and sometimes they're just not funny and nobody laughs. Here's a joke. Why does the cow wear a bell? Because its horns don't work. Do you get it? Do you think it is funny? Well, maybe it's not that funny. I told you that it was difficult being a comedian. Drugs. There are two different types of drugs. There are legal drugs and there are illegal drugs. Legal drugs are the type of drugs that the doctor gives you when you are sick. Illegal drugs are the drugs that people sell on the street. Illegal drugs are very dangerous. If someone ever wants you to try any type of substance that you are not sure about, you should always say no. People who sell drugs on the street are criminals. If they get caught, they will be sent to jail. They sell drugs to get money. They don't care that people's lives are ruined from taking drugs. If you take illegal drugs, you can become addicted to them. That means that you just have to have the drug no matter what. Some people steal from other people to get money to buy drugs. Drugs affect your mind. If you take drugs, you will not be able to think clearly. Your marks in school will drop. Your memory won't be very good. Your personality won't be the same. It is very unfortunate that some people do try drugs. They think that it won't hurt them. They are wrong. If you are smart, you will stay away from all drugs, except for the ones that the doctor gives you. Drugs are just bad news. If you know someone who is thinking about trying drugs, tell them that their entire life could be ruined. In America, they have a saying, just say no to drugs. It is a good saying, but I think I would rather say, I'm just too smart to take drugs. My sister's visit to Canada. My sister had never been to Canada, but came for a visit last April. I picked her up at the airport in Toronto and drove her through the traffic and multi-lane highways, past the grapevines and peach trees to Niagara Falls, where I live. She was very tired from the flight and soon slept. The first day, we walked to see the falls. The spray from the falls drifts high into the air and across the people standing to watch. There are people from all over the world watching the water and using their cameras. Because it was April, there was still ice beside the water, huge chunks of ice that looked like white rocks. In the river, there were floating pieces of ice moving downstream. The next day, we went to the town where the Niagara River joins Lake Ontario. The weather was warm. We walked a long way, and our feet were hot, so we went down to the edge of the water to put our feet in. One toe in was enough. The water was so cold it made our feet ache. A piece of ice drifted beside our feet. I put one foot in for a second, then out, as the pain of the cold went right through me. My sister could not understand how it could be so warm, but there was still ice. Another day, we went to see my daughter. She is living on a farm, an hour's drive away. We walked through her trees. The buds were starting to turn into leaves. We stopped and looked at the spring wildflowers. We climbed across a creek by walking over a fallen tree. We saw the footprints of raccoons by the water. There was fresh air and sunshine and blue sky. On the way home, we stopped for hamburgers and fries at a drive through restaurant. She had never been to a drive through restaurant before. Then we went to a donut shop. There are no donut shops where she lives. There was a choice of twenty different types of donuts, some round, 
some with holes, some with frosting, some with jam inside. Each was different. The days passed quickly, and soon it was time to take her back to the airport. Some of the trees now had leaves. Some of the tulips were now blooming. It was hard to say goodbye to my sister. I hope we can visit again soon. A summer Sunday. Today the sun was warm. The sky was blue with a few white clouds. It was a good day to pick strawberries. It was a good day to go to the beach. I drove to a pick-your-own farm where people can pick their own fruit and buy it. There, the fruit is very fresh and delicious. The owner of the farm gave everyone a row to pick their strawberries. Everyone was wearing sun hats. I knelt down on the straw between the rows and picked the big, juicy red berries. I tasted one. It was warm from the sun. When I bit into it, the juice was sweet and strong. When three big pails were full, I went to pay for them and picked up some recipes for some strawberry desserts. I packed two of the pails in a cooler with some ice, and the other one we would eat at the beach. I met my daughter at the beach. She had a soft pink blanket on the sand. This beach is beside a lake. And across the lake, about fifty kilometers away, the large city can sometimes be seen. Today, the wind blew cooler air across the lake over the people on the beach. There were children playing in the water. One man helped his son dig holes in the sand, and the water ran into the holes. One lady held her children's hands and walked down into the water. Families climbed over the rocks and sat on the last rock. Where the water was deep, teenagers rode bicycles and rollerblades along the path beside the beach. Adults walked and ran along this path, carrying water bottles around their waists. We sat on the blanket and ate sandwiches of meat and lettuce and strawberries from the pail. We talked and read books and lay in the sun, relaxing. We wore sunscreen, but our skin was getting hot. How cold was the water? We walked across the sand that almost burned our feet to the edge of the water. She went right in and lay down floating. I put my toes in and felt the chill through my body. I went up to my knees, then my thighs, but that was far enough. My whole body was cooled down. I headed back to the blanket to lay in the sun again. Soon it was time to go home. She was coming to my house for supper. We drove down the highway with the windows open and our hair blowing in the warm breeze. We cut the strawberries up and made a strawberry dessert with cake and ice cream. We sat outside in the backyard under the maple trees with the birds singing around us and ate our supper. It was a perfect ending to a relaxing summer day. My parents. My parents live in England, and I live in Canada. I don't see them often. They used to come and visit on a plane, and we would pick them up at Toronto Airport. But now they are older and say the flight is too long for them. I went to visit them last year with my son, their grandson. They live by the ocean, and we could hear the sound of the waves through the bedroom window and see the blue water of the English Channel. There is an island with a castle on top in the bay. We walked many times on the beach and picked up pebbles and feathers. We visited the island and walked up the steep hill to the castle. My mother likes to cook. She makes delicious cakes and pies. We went for a hike and picked wild blackberries. She made them into a pie that smelled so good coming out of the oven and tasted so good on our plates. She has many cookbooks with recipes from all over the world and likes to try new things. She can make pastry very easily and rolls it with a rolling pin quickly. When I tried to make pastry, it sticks to the rolling pin. It has holes at the bottom of the pie and it tastes like a rock. Her pastry is crisp and tender. My father likes to garden. He grows lettuce, carrots, potatoes. Tomatoes, cucumbers, and many flowers.
When my mother was very ill last year, she had to stay in bed. He planted roses outside her bedroom window, so she could open the curtains and see them. Their house has a small room with windows all around, and they plant seeds there in winter in small pots. The warmth from the sun makes the seeds grow, and in spring they are a good size to be planted outside. In the house beside them and in the house in front of them, there are older ladies whose husbands have died. These ladies do not drive, so my father takes my mother and the two ladies to the town for shopping every week. He helps one find her groceries because she cannot see well. He helps her take tapes of books from the library so she can listen to books instead of reading them because of her eyes. He helps them cut their grass and fix anything that is broken in the house. I am very proud of my parents. They are over 80 years old and often hurt when they move around, but still, they help other people and they help each other. They have been married for over 50 years, but still, my father loves my mother enough to plant roses for her to cheer her up when she was ill. The Planets of Our Solar System The planet on which we live is called the Earth. Our planet is constantly moving around the Sun, and each year the Earth travels all the way around the Sun. But there are many other planets that also travel around the Sun. Together with the Sun, the planets, and various other bodies, the Earth is part of our solar system. The planet that is closest to the Sun, Is Mercury. Mercury is extremely hot and it is much smaller than the Earth. The second planet from the Sun is Venus. Venus is about the same size as the Earth. Venus is also very hot. The Earth is the third planet from the Sun. The Earth is unusual among the planets because it has such a large moon. The Earth is bigger than the Moon, but the Moon is still quite large. It takes about one month for the Moon to travel around the Earth. The fourth planet from the Sun is Mars. Mars is known for its red color. Mars is smaller and colder than the Earth. Mars has two very small moons. After the planet Mars, there are many small bodies called the asteroids. These rocky objects are much smaller than the planets. The first four planets are all made of rock and metal. The remaining planets, however, are mostly made of frozen gases. The fifth planet is called Jupiter. Jupiter is the largest planet. It has many moons that travel around it, and it also has a large red spot. The sixth planet is called Saturn. Saturn is the second largest planet, and it is famous for the wide rings that surround it. These rings are made up of many smaller objects that are found in the same area. The seventh planet is called Uranus. The eighth planet is called Neptune. These planets are also gas giants, but they are smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. Both Uranus and Neptune are so far from the Sun that scientists only discovered these planets during the past few hundred years using telescopes. The other planets had all been visible to curious people for many thousands of years. The ninth planet is called Pluto. Pluto is very small, and it is much more rocky than the gas giants. Some scientists believe that Pluto is not really a planet at all. They suggest that Pluto is the largest of many asteroids that are found at the edge of the solar system. The solar system is a vast place. So far, people have not traveled beyond the moon. But perhaps someday, human astronauts will visit the other planets of our solar system. Learning to Drive Each year, many young people learn to drive a car. For many people, Learning to drive is important because the car is an important method of transportation in many places. Before learning to drive a car, it is important to understand the rules of the road. A beginning driver should already understand the many signs that are found along the roads. Also, the student driver should know the many rules about changing lanes, turning, 
stopping, and many other aspects of driving. In addition, the driver should be familiar with the way the car is operated. It is important to know how to use the lights, signals, brakes, accelerator, and steering wheel. When a person starts learning to drive, it may take some time to become skillful. It takes some practice to become an expert in driving a car. One must become familiar with steering, speeding up, and slowing down. At first, it is good to practice driving in a large open space, such as an empty parking lot. Here, one can practice without being a danger to anyone. When a person gains some skill in driving, it is then safe enough to practice driving on a road. Of course, a student driver must still be very careful. He or she should always have an expert driver in the car with him or her. Many beginning drivers take driving lessons from professional instructors who can teach safe driving techniques. Eventually, the young driver is ready for a driving test, which is needed to obtain a regular driver's license. This test is supervised by a government official. In the driving test, the driver must show that he or she can control the car with great skill by being able to make turns and to park the car in small spaces. But he or she must also show respect for the rules of the road by driving at a proper speed and obeying all traffic signs and signals. Of course, even when one has obtained a driver's license, it is always important to drive carefully and responsibly. Snow. Snow is the white substance that falls to the ground during cold weather conditions. Each tiny piece of snow, called a snowflake, is a very small amount of water that has frozen into an unusual shape. During the winter months, huge numbers of snowflakes fall to the ground, covering the land in a white blanket of snow. In many parts of the world, people never see any snow. Snow only falls when there is moisture in the air, and when the temperature falls below the freezing point of water, which is zero degrees Celsius. During the winter, snow falls instead of rain. One advantage of snow is that it allows many fun outdoor activities. Children like to play in the snow. For example, they may make a snowman by rolling snow into a large ball and then placing these balls of snow on top of each other in the shape of a person. Another fun activity in the snow is skiing. Skis are very long, thin, flat pieces of hard material that one wears on one's feet. Wearing skis allows a person to slide along the surface of the snow. People can ski down the side of a hill, traveling at great speeds. Many people find the sport of downhill skiing to be very exciting. Some people like to ski along flat ground, often traveling great distances. This sport, called cross-country skiing, is an excellent way to develop physical fitness. Of course, snow also causes some problems. Snow can make driving dangerous because falling snow makes roads slippery, and on a windy day, blowing snow can make it difficult to see very far. It can also be a lot of work to remove snow from the roads and sidewalks. Snow is a heavy substance, and it must be cleared away using a shovel or a large machine. Many people love the beauty of the land when it is covered by snow. The white covering of snow over the fields and trees can give a feeling of peace and calm. If you have never seen snow before, you should someday experience this strange and wonderful substance. My friend in the next office. When I started my job a year ago at the university. I did not know my way around. I did not know where to find anything. I had a million questions, but Diane in the next office took me on a tour, showing me the places to eat, the library, the lecture rooms, where to get a picture ID card, how to get from one building to another. When I had a question, I asked Diane how to use the telephone, where to make copies, where to print with my computer, the location of my mailbox. She teaches as I do. We both spend a lot of time helping students and answering their questions. 
She giggles a lot. I hear her laugh with her students. Sometimes she asks my advice about her work or about a problem, and I ask her advice. Sometimes she comes into my office and says, "I am really angry. Can I whine to you?" Then she talks about a problem, and I listen. And then she returns cheerfully to her office. Sometimes I go into her office and say, "I'm upset about something that happened. Can I come in for a minute?" Then I grumble to her, and she listens. And then I go back cheerfully to my office. Each of us feels better when we have shared our problems. Then they are no longer problems. Diane is shy in a group of people. She is quiet and does not start a conversation. Everyone around her talks, and she listens. On Friday afternoons, she makes popcorn for everyone. We all sit in the staff room and eat microwaved popcorn and drink tea and talk. We start to relax for the weekend and talk about our plans. She is a good friend. She helps my students when I am not there. She wishes me good luck when I go to a lecture. I am very glad that she can be my friend in the office beside mine. The musician. There once was a little girl named Rain Angel. She loved to sit at the piano and play. Rain Angel was a very gifted girl. She had a voice that gave people shivers, and she loved to sing. As Rain got older, she continued to love music. Rain became involved in the choirs and bands at her high school. She loved performing in front of people. She couldn't help but feel the sense of power she had when she was up on stage, and there was always loud clapping when she finished a song. Rain soon went out on her own and looked for someone that could help her become famous. Rain wanted to share her talent with the world. She felt that her special talent for music helped people feel good. Rain went out into the big world, and she did very well. She was always performing her best, and someone finally noticed her. Her new agent helped her to make her first album. Rain became famous because she never quit trying. Rain loved her new way of life. She continued singing and playing her piano. She was even taught how to write her own music. Rain Angel had always dreamed of becoming a celebrity. She always remembered her friends and family when she was famous because they had always believed in her. Rain Angel strove for a faraway place, and it became her reality. She always believed that what she wanted to become was her choice. She believed that if you have the strength and determination, you can make your dreams come true. The circus. Wow! A big tent was in the middle of the town's parking lot. We were going to a three-ring circus. I couldn't wait for it to begin. Inside and outside of the tent, toys, balloons, and food were being sold. All of the children were so very excited. Inside the tent, we found good seats so we could see everything. The band started to play loud music, and the ringmaster came out with a big, tall hat on his head. In one ring, there were small animals, dogs, monkeys, and parrots doing tricks. The dogs were dressed in funny clothes, and so were the monkeys. They rode on bicycles, danced, and climbed ladders. There were wild tigers and lions in a big round wire cage. A man with a whip was inside the cage with them. He had them trained to jump through a hoop of fire and to roll over. He even kissed them. He was very brave. During the break in the middle of the circus, funny clowns came out and did silly things. They had happy faces and sad faces. Some had big red noses that honked if you squeezed them. There were rides on elephants too. I didn't go on one because it cost too much money. The last act took up the whole tent. It was the acrobats. They hung from their teeth, their feet, and their necks high up in the air.
They also swung high up in the air and flew to each other. It's kind of scary to watch because I was afraid they might fall. I had a very good time at the circus. However, my tummy felt kind of sick from all the cotton candy and junk food I ate. Going to the grocery store. Each week, I go to the grocery store to buy food for my family. I get a shopping cart from the front of the store, and I push the cart all around the store. The cart is large, but when I am finished shopping, the cart is nearly full. The grocery store is also called a supermarket. When I go shopping, I start out in the produce section of the supermarket. The produce section is where the fresh fruits and vegetables are kept. I like to buy different kinds of fruit, such as apples, oranges, and bananas. The vegetables that I often buy are carrots, peas, and corn. I also buy tomatoes when they are bright red in color. I often buy a bag of potatoes or a bag of rice. After visiting the produce section, I go to the meat section. Here I buy poultry such as chicken and turkey. I often buy seafood, especially fish. I also buy beef and sometimes pork or lamb. I also visit the dairy section. Where I can buy milk and cheese, sometimes I also buy ice cream or yogurt. When I have finished in the meat and dairy sections, I then move to the bakery section. This is where loaves of bread are baked and sold. There are many different kinds of bread in the bakery section. The bakery section also sells pasta, such as macaroni and spaghetti, and of course you can buy pies. Cakes and cookies in the bakery section. These foods are very sweet and tasty. I also pick up a few other things at the supermarket, such as soap, toothpaste, and cleaning supplies. But sometimes I forget to buy something that I plan to get. Maybe I should make a list of the things I need to buy. A day at the beach. When the hot summer weather arrives, many people like to cool off by visiting the beach. Often there is a cool breeze that comes off the water, and of course the water itself is cool and refreshing. One of the favorite activities at the beach is building sandcastles. Children use small shovels and pails to move the sand. They can build small forts and castles by carefully forming and shaping the sand. Building sand castles is a lot of fun, but you shouldn't build them too close to the water. A wave might come and wash your sand castle away. There are also many games that people like to play at the beach. Some people play catch with a small plastic disc called a frisbee. The frisbee glides smoothly through the air. Other people like to play beach volleyball in the soft sand. Some people prefer just to relax on the beach. They like to lie down on a blanket and feel the warm sunshine. I like to sit on the beach with an ice cream cone, but you have to eat it quickly before it melts. Of course, the main attraction of a beach is the water. Many children learn to swim at the beach. And enjoy playing in the water. Some people like to swim vigorously. Other people like to relax in the water on an inflatable floating mattress. Other people just wade around in the water as a way to keep cool. When it is a windy day, some people try sports such as surfing. Going to the beach is surely one of the best ways to spend a summer day. Making cookies. Mmm, something smells good. My friend's mom is making cookies. They are chocolate chip, my favorite. I think I'll go home and ask my mom if we can make cookies too. I run all the way home and rush through the door. I yell, "Mom, mom!" She comes out from her bedroom, her eyes wide. "What?" she answers, a little worried. I breathlessly ask if we can please, pretty please, make cookies. She smiles and says, "I guess so." "Yes," I reply.
First, Mom tells me to get out the cooking stuff. So I get out the mixer and bowl, the measuring cups and spoons, and the cookie sheets. Then she tells me to get out the recipe book. I remind her that the recipe is on the chocolate chip package. Right, she says. Then she asks me to look at the recipe and get out the things we need, like flour, sugar, and butter. We set the oven temperature to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we mix all the flour and other stuff, ingredients, together. Last, we added the chocolate chips. We dropped the batter by big teaspoons full onto the cookie sheets. We set the timer for 12 minutes and just sit back and enjoy the good smell. The buzzer rings. We take the cookies out. Oh, do they look good! We don't even wait for them to cool down. Both mom and I get a big glass of cold milk and two big warm cookies each. Yum yum! Want to join us? Halloween. Ghosts, goblins, witches, princes and princesses, kings, queens, skeletons. So many of these things are walking down my street. Oh no! They are coming to my door. The doorbell chimes, and I slowly open the door. There, standing on my front porch, is a little ghost and a cute little witch. They hold up a bag and say, "Trick or treat." I put candy into their bags, and they smile and say, "Thank you." Every October thirty-first is Halloween. That is when children dress up as different things, not just funny people, but things like animals or fruits or vegetables. They go from door to door and get different candies or little toys from the people in the houses. Some children, who are not very nice, will do naughty things to houses where people are not home, like throwing eggs at their windows. I think that is bad. Sometimes people decorate their houses for this day. Some of the houses can be pretty scary. They'll have scary noises coming from a tape recorder too. However, it's only for a few days out of the year. So we may as well have fun with it. This year, my brother is dressing up as a skeleton, and I'm dressing up as a bride. I am wearing my mom's wedding dress. It is fun dressing up in costumes and putting on lots of makeup. Sometimes our friends don't even know who we really are. The best part of Halloween is the candy, of course. I once got an entire garbage bag full of candy. My mom and dad took it away because I was eating too much. Mom gave me a piece of candy every day, though. If you eat too much candy, you can get a stomach ache. You need to remember to brush your teeth often too, so you don't get cavities. Still, that candy sure does taste good. Well, it's time to go trick or treating, so off I go, door to door, getting yummy candy and hearing people say, "Oh, aren't you pretty!" New Year's, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! What is New Year's? Well, to me, a new year is when the date of the year changes. This year it is two thousand and one, and on December thirty-first at midnight, it will change to two thousand and two. I wonder who invented the changing of the years, and how it was made the way it is. It must have been someone a long time ago, since it's already 2001. When New Year's comes closer, a lot of people talk about New Year's resolutions. I don't bother making resolutions because I never do them anyway, and the ones I do make are usually ones that will happen anyway. I guess it's just common sense. The biggest reason why I like New Year's is because of the fireworks that we have here in Canada and many other countries too. You should see some of the fireworks that go off. There are many different colors. There's pink, blue, purple, yellow, green, red, even white, silver, and gold. Fireworks make loud bangs, squeals, siren sounds, and sometimes all at once. There are lots of different sounds, but I can't even explain what they are all like. Fireworks are best when it's very dark outside. They light up the whole sky. Sometimes they look as though they are going to fall on you. I like New Year's because it's fun in other ways, but the fireworks are the best. You can buy fireworks to use for your own fireworks show. However, you have to be careful that no one gets burned or hurt. Usually, there are parties at New Year's. 
Some people really dress up fancy and even wear masks. They don't know who one another is until midnight when they take their masks off. As midnight comes very close, everybody begins to count down, and then everyone yells out, Happy New Year's! and bangs pots and pans or rings bells or honk horns. Join me in the countdown on New Year's Eve. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, Happy New Year! More music. I like music. I have always liked music. Even when I was very young, I liked music. I like to listen to it and to make it. When I was a little girl, listening to nice music would sometimes make me cry. That may seem silly, but the music was so pretty that I cried. As I grew older, I started to take piano lessons. I was not very good at first, but after a while, I got better. Also, as I grew older, I started to take violin lessons. I did not sound very good at all at first, but I improved. When I was a teenager in high school, I made sure I had music classes every year. Those were the classes I enjoyed most of all. Everyone loved music, and we had a lot of fun. I started to take private singing lessons while I was in high school, too. I also sang in the choir, played in a band, and acted in plays in high school. The plays were all musicals, so I got to sing and dance and enjoy music that way also. It was so much fun pretending to be other people. When I finished high school, I went to university to learn how to be a music teacher. That was a lot of fun because every day I was with other people who loved music as much as I do. Mostly, I played the piano. But I also learned how to play the drums, a saxophone, a trombone, a French horn, a clarinet, a flute, which I really was not very good at, and a viola. I took more singing lessons, too. We did not have plays to sing and act in, but I sang in the university choir. Some years, I played the piano for other students who were learning other instruments. One year, I played duets. With another girl who was also there to play piano. She and I made sure we played fast, funny songs, so we really enjoyed ourselves doing it. Now I am a music teacher. I do not have a lot of students, not as many as I used to have anyway. I still find it very rewarding. I like to see people who start off not knowing very much, if anything, and go on to be very good at creating music. I still love listening to music also. Music makes me happy when I am sad. It makes me want to dance or sing when I'm already happy. Mostly, music just makes me glad that I am me and that music is alive in me. Babies. My baby is asleep in my arms. Her soft cheek rests against my chest while her sweet breath puffs gently on my skin. Her tiny lips are puckered a bit. Her little eyelids flutter. I wonder what she dreams about as she sleeps. Does she dream? I have heard her whimper in her sleep. Sometimes she awakens with a scream. What is so scary in her little baby dreams? Once I heard her giggle as she slept. Her dreams must have been sweet that day. I have had three babies. The one I am holding now is my last one. My other babies are grown up more and now at school. I love their childish play and laughter. I miss their baby dimples and their baby sounds and smells. There is such joy in the birth of a new baby. We hear their first little cry, telling us all is well with their small world. We feel their newborn skin, wrinkled, soft, and slightly damp. We feel each little limb and are filled with wonder and humility. Life is good as baby takes its first food from its mother. Family gathers around, each waiting to hold and love this newest member. Each time the baby cries, its mom worries, and their bond becomes stronger. Babies have their own special smell. Some have described it as milk and innocence. It is the sweetest smell on earth, I think. It cannot be copied. Somehow it disappears as baby grows. 
I love to hear my baby talk. Once in a while, I can even understand a little bit. She is so serious in her baby talk that I just have to pick her up and hug her. I love to hear her say, Mommy! When my baby is tickled, or when the dog or her big brothers do something funny, it is so sweet to hear her baby laugh. It's such a cute little giggle. Sometimes she laughs so hard, her face turns red, tears come to her eyes, and she falls down weak with the laughter. Those who watch her can't help but laugh too. I hope she always laughs so easily. The parents watch with pride and joy as baby grows and has many firsts. There is the first time baby sleeps through the night, rolls over, smiles, laughs, hugs and kisses. Then there is the first tooth, crawling, first step, and first word. With each new first, the baby becomes less a baby. These steps are a little sad to parents, too, because they know they're losing their baby. However, to a mother, even an adult child is still her baby. My baby is not perfect. Sometimes she gets mad or whines for no reason. But to me, she is still beautiful. Her smiles more than make up for her tears. Her hugs wipe away when she's been bad. I intend to cherish each moment with my baby while I can. Bedtime. I am almost nine years old and my bedtime is 8 30 p.m. I think that is so unfair. I think I am old enough to stay up until at least 9 p.m. My parents say that I have to go to bed early because I have school the next day. I can't wait until I am grown up and can stay awake as long as I want. Even though I think I should be able to go to bed later, I do like our nighttime routine. At about 8 15 p.m., my mom sends us upstairs to put on our pajamas. When we come back downstairs, we read together. Sometimes mom will read to us and sometimes we will read to her. If dad is not working, he will sometimes read too. Mostly it is mom we read with, though. When we read, mom helps us with words we cannot read. We have to try and sound the word out, but if we are really stuck, she will help us. If we come to a place in our reading where we do not understand the meaning of what was written, we stop reading and look at mom. She will tell us what it means or help us figure it out on our own. After we are finished reading, we say goodnight to everyone in the house. First, we say goodnight to mom and give her a hug and a kiss. Then we do the same for dad, then our little sister, and then our dog. Afterwards, we go upstairs and brush our teeth. I have to do special stretching exercises for the muscles in my chest and legs, or I get pains when I run and play. I do my stretching before I get into bed. After my exercises, either my brother or I turn off the lights. We share a bedroom, so we take turns turning the light off. Before we get into bed, we say our prayers. After we get into our beds, my brother and I talk to each other for a long time. We tell each other about our day or about what we hope will happen in the future, about our friends, and all sorts of other important things. After a while, we get so tired we just fall asleep in the middle of talking. Even though we go to bed at 8 30 p.m., we talk so long we don't go to sleep until about 10 o'clock p.m. I still do not know why I have to go to bed so early when I'm not even tired. Why do I like mathematics? Sometimes there is a problem in life that has no answer. Perhaps a child has trouble learning. Perhaps someone becomes ill. Perhaps there was love, but now there is conflict. These problems are hard to solve. There is no single answer. Many people have opinions on what is the best answer. But in mathematics, there is an answer, a single answer that is right. There is no doubt, there is no argument. This answer is right. If we ask, What is 5 plus 7? the answer is 12. If we ask, How do you raise a child? The answer would depend on the child and the parents. Sometimes there is more than one way to reach an answer. Imagine we want to find the area of a triangle. The triangle has a right angle. The two sides surrounding the right angle are 20 millimeters and 30 millimeters. The formula for the area of a triangle is one half of base height. 
we could consider the 20 millimeter side as the base and 30 millimeters as the height. We could consider the 30 millimeter side as the base and the 20 millimeter side as the height. Both ways would produce the same answer. The area is 300 square millimeters. Alternatively, we could consider the base as the third side of the triangle, and then we would have to draw a height and measure it. The height would be neither 20 nor 30. But still, we would end up with the same answer. In math, the answer does not change. Another reason I like math is the way it brings order. There can be a whole set of numbers or a whole set of measurements that mean nothing until mathematics organizes them into a pattern. An average number can be found. Graphs can be drawn. The spread of the numbers and probabilities of a certain number happening can be calculated. This is like having a whole lot of dirty dishes after supper. Applying math is like washing and sorting the dishes and putting them back into the cupboard. Math is a powerful tool. Math should be our friend, and we will find more ways to use it to better our lives.